so yeah thanks for inviting me here to speak and this is what i'm going to speak about so yes i i work at ibm quantum specifically at the zurich research lab and what i work on is uh, quantum error correction and also quantum procedural generation but i'm not here just to tell you things i did now, this is a hackathon, so I'm here to tell you the things that I think would be best to do during a hackathon. And strangely enough, that is uh, quantum error correction and quantum procedural generation. I really do think they are the best things that you could do. Um, so I want to very briefly say um, my thoughts about what you could do in, in, in quantum error correction before I move on to procedural generation. Um, so quantum error correction is something that we want to do to make scalable fault tolerant quantum computers. So usually when you talk about quantum error correcting codes, they have loads of qubits. But I think it's important to note that even if you've got three, four, five qubits, which you do have with uh, public IBM quantum systems and maybe other systems that you have access to, you can do proof of principle experiments. So for example, back in 2014, there was a, a, a experiment by some of my colleagues, uh, which uh, did this thing called a 202 code. And that uses only four qubits, but you can detect all kinds of quantum errors. So that's something that you could reproduce, but also it needs four qubits because it has to measure all of the qubits at the end. Nowadays, we can reuse qubits, we can keep measuring them. So there is a way to do it with three, which you could try and figure out. Uh, also, I did a five qubit, ex uh, qubit experiment back in 2016. I wasn't an IBMer at the time, and um, it was the first time I had access to any hardware when IBM put five qubits on the cloud, and I was able to do this experiment that I had been planning. So you can uh, check that out. You can think about how to extend it. Now we have even more devices. And also repetition codes are arguably the simplest form of quantum error correction. They, you can use them to test how well quantum error correction works. You can look for different kinds of errors. You can try and work out what weird stuff is going on and how that corresponds to the physics of the device. There's plenty to do with quantum error correction. I wrote a chapter of the Kiskit textbook specifically on how to do repetition codes. And I also made that as a paper. You can find the reference here. And I also had some lectures on repetition codes and all other kinds of things in quantum error correction um, at the Kiskit Summer School last year. And you can find the lectures um, at the link here. So if you want to know some possible ideas and resources on quantum error creation, this is your slide. However, I'm now going to get on with quantum procedural generation. So what is procedural generation? Uh, well, it's also called procedural content generation because that's what it is. It, it's the algorithmic generation of content. And what is content well it's a very nebulous term it doesn't really mean anything specifically it can mean lots of different kinds of things but uh, i mostly think about it in the context of computer games so in a computer game uh, you may have a lovingly handmade world um, and with with levels that have been created specifically by people and tuned perfectly but you can also have games where the content for the levels, the puzzles, uh, the map on which you play is algorithmically generated. So if something like No Man's Sky, where you can explore an infinite universe, of course, uh, there were an infinite amount of person hours involved in creating that. Instead, it's being generated algorithmically. So it could be things like uh, images or puzzles or maps or objects that you see in a game generated algorithmically. And there's all kinds of different um, algorithms, different computational tasks that you can do within procedural generation from uh, quite relatively simple things like noise functions, which just give you some sort of a, a texture effectively to solving very complex optimization problems. Because if you say, I want to level in a game and it has to satisfy all of these conditions and it has to be one that the player can actually complete at the end, but also it, I want it to be maximally this or maximally that in certain uh, parameters that you could assign to it, then that's solving a very complex constrained optimization problem, which is something that we, is, is very hard for us to do. 
And so currently people have to find workarounds in their algorithms, but with quantum computers, we could just drive straight at it, or at least that's what we would hope. So I think uh, quantum computing, um, so procedural generation is quite a unique field, I think, for quantum computing in that uh, even now with the modest resources that we have uh, and the quite error prone resources that we have now, we can do some of the very simple tasks in procedural generation. We can't do them better than we could do with a classical computer, but we can do them with a quantum computer. It's a thing that a quantum computer can do, which I think is quite nice, even now. And in the future, when we have scalable fault tolerant quantum computers and we can do things uh, that we cannot do at the moment, we can solve problems that would take classical computers too long, that we basically can't solve those problems, then we'll be able to find ways of doing things in procedural generation that we can't do at the moment. We'll be able to take routes towards procedural generation that we can't do now. So we'll have some unique to quantum computing procedural generation at that time. And so what the hope is that we can then continuously go from one to the other. We're already useful, even though we don't produce anything that's unique to quantum computing. Everything can be classically simulated. And in the future, we will get to a point of uniqueness. And over time, we can get ever more sophisticated with our procedure generation as the technology develops. OK, so now I'm going to go through three concrete examples of work that uh, we have done on procedure generation with quantum computers. And the idea of the first one is to be step one, or perhaps even step zero really at this very simple end of showing that even with current quantum computational resources, we can do things that are arguably useful in procedural generation. And when I say quantum computational resources, that's quite a, a weird term. It's kind of a bit of a weasel word or weasel term in that I'm, I'm kind of trying to, to trick you into thinking I'm talking about quantum computers, but actually, uh, I'll come. I'll come clean. It's actually better to use a simulator for this method. So it's actually a method, and that's why I'm calling it step zero. It's a method in which we are uh, solving it by creating and running a quantum circuit, but we've not yet got to the point where it's, we should be running it on a quantum computer rather than in a simulator. Anyway, caveats over. Let's dive into what it actually is. So. Um, one of the very early methods in procedural generation was to use blur effects. So this is sort of back in the 80s when people are starting to think about how they might do height map generation. Um, they uh, thought about the idea of just slap, slapping down some random points and blurring them, and that would give you something that might look like a map. Um, so basically, since that was step one of classical procedure generation. I thought, well, let's use that for step one for quantum procedure generation as well. So the idea is basically to encode height maps in quantum circuits. Um, so what we do uh, specifically is we take a height map, so, or a, you could think of it as a monochrome image, just as you see on the slide here. And we assign each pixel a unique bit string. So if you had four pixels, then you would need uh, uh, to use the, the four, you would need to use sort of zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. Each of one of those gets assigned to a different pixel. And therefore you need two bits in order to cover that entire image. If you had a large, for larger images, you will need more bits. Uh, but nevertheless, you're gonna use as many bits as you require to cover the entire image, assign each, each pixel, a unique bit string, um, but also we're going to choose to do this such that neighboring bit strings have very uh, closely related, sorry, neighboring pixels have very closely related bit strings. Uh, specifically, neighboring on neighboring pixels, the bit strings will only differ on one bit. So if you were to uh, have the bit string for a particular a pixel and you were to do a bit flip on one of those and you move to a neighbor and if you do a bit flip on another one then you would 
move to a nape, or at least hopefully. You can't completely cover, uh, you can't completely have a correspondence between distance on the image and the hamming distance of the bit strings, but you do do it as close as you can. And then uh, what you do is use an amplitude encoding. So you create a quantum state such that uh, the probability of getting the corresponding bit string, if you were to measure, it is proportional to the brightness of that pixel in the height map. So you can then come up with a circuit which creates such a superposition state, and that's how you encode the image as a quantum circuit. And then if you have a quantum circuit, you can just measure it many, many times, such that you can get the statistics of all of those probabilities and thereby get the image back from the circuit. So this is a way of turning a simple image into a circuit and then turning that circuit back into images. And so far, we've done no blurring. This is just image to circuit, circuit to image. If you do nothing else, you get your original image back. Um, then what we can do is modify the circuit. And so this was uh, originally designed kind of as a pedagogical exercise. So people could take this and think about what it means to add more gates to the circuit, to visualize the effect of those gates on the circuit and have them think about uh, how, have them get to, to know in some sense how gates uh, affect superpositions. And uh, the way that we, have defined the mapping of bit strings to pixels means that if you were to, for example, take a, a rotation around the x-axis and apply it to a single qubit, and if you did that for a very small angle, then not much would happen. If you did it for a little bit of a bigger angle, uh, be, because neighboring bit strings uh, correspond to uh, neighboring um, uh, pixels on the image, then amplitude starts to bleed out into neighboring pixels. And uh, therefore, you get this kind of blur effect. So you see here in, in figure A, uh, an image just made of two pixels. This actually corresponds to a GHZ state, which is a, an, a famous entangled state. And we start applying single qubit rotations. It starts to blur out a bit. Although it's not a normal kind of blur as you would get when you apply your favorite blur filter. It looks more like if you view some street lights through some net curtains, I think. And then you apply that more and more and more, and you get this effect. But because it's not just a blur, because it's a coherent quantum effect, you're also getting interference effects. And so, it is, so it's a blur-like thing, but with quantum artifacts due to the interference effects. And uh, the extreme of this, if you go to a very large rotation angle. It doesn't just completely blur out in a, a uniform way, but instead you get this checkerboard pattern, which explicitly comes from the, the interference effect. So it, only because we chose those two specific pixels that correspond to the GHZ state did it uh, turn into that checkerboard pattern. So it's sensitive to the entanglement that is going on in the image. Um, but yeah, it's, you get interference effects. Um, it's blur-like, but with interference effects. Quantum artifacts, you can call it. How useful it is depends on how much you like those artifacts. Uh, so I'm not claiming this is going to be the, the best filter in every image app uh, in the future, but some people could, could have fun with it and, and be able to use it for interesting things. So for example, um, my example usage, uh, uses of it were in sort of hackathon-like context to show that it's an interesting thing to use in a hackathon. So, for example, I made um, uh, height maps that could be used as sort of terrains. So what I did was I, I slapped down some random pixels, as you can see an example of in figure A here, and I applied... Um, this quantum blur effect by just using a fairly large rotation angle and gave that gave me a, a sort of a texture. It may look kind of random to you, but it's not completely random because, because of the way we've chosen the pixels, there are continuities in here. There are high points, which are surrounded, or bright points, which are surrounded by 
not so bright points there are dark points which are usually surrounded by not so dark points so it's it's more continuous than you would get if you just chose random brightnesses and then i think oh well i'm going to make an island and i'm going to plan out a kind of um, a plan for what that island should be and then i'm going to take many of these textures and splat them down on the island to make it more textured and then that gives me something as you can see in d so in D, I've also the white parts are the the, the high parts, so the, the bright parts, the blue parts are the low parts, and then you sort of go to to yellow and then to green. So I'm thinking of these as being different types of of uh, terrain in a terrain map, and then you can take that and visualize it in something like Minecraft, something like Minecraft being mine test which is a open source program which is similar to minecraft and so what you can see on the left of the image is a, a map that i have made uh, in mine test uh, based on one of these so it, so you can see that now i've taken something quantum and made a world that you can actually go around and explore so that's the kind of cool thing that someone can do in a hackathon right so you could do something like that, uh, either using quantum blur uh, or by coming up with your own method. Now, you can also encode other forms of data, not just height maps. So I thought of a way how, how to encode blocks in Mario levels. So to encode a Mario level uh, in this way. And I applied more and more of the blur effect as you go through the level. Uh, so it starts off looking very much like the first level of the first Mario game. Well, you know, the first Mario platform. Um, but as you go on, it gets uh, less what you're used to seeing. And you can um, do, you can do you, with music, you can do make animations out of it. It's a, it's a fun sort of thing to play around with, which is what it was made for, really. Um, so is it useful? Well, you can use it in hackathons, so arg arguably, yes. Um, but also, uh, an indie game studio that makes actual commercial games has also uh, been experimented with using it in their game Clay. So this is a game that works, it would work perfectly well without quantum blur. It, it doesn't really need the quantumness. Let's not uh, be, let's not hype this, but they, they, they've gotten something out of experimenting with this technology and they use it for encounter generation of encountering the baddie and the baddie is supposed to be like a rogue ai so they like the idea that um this is if you if you take something which is the, the dynamics of a quantum system maybe you can see that it has dynamics that aren't completely random that that follow some sort of laws but you can see that it's kind of weird right so they they think it's a, a nice thing to use for their strange rogue ai uh, also, we had an artist come to Kizkit Camp Europe back in 2019, and she used it uh, in her hackathon project at that hackathon, but also then went on to use it more in her art later. Um, and also another artist, Roman Lipsky, has also uh, made quite extensive use of it and has had uh, even an, an exhibition on it uh, in, in 2020. Was it 2020 or was it 2021? Uh, the years all run together when you're my age. And you can see at this exhibition, there's a rather strange thing, which is uh, not just the art by the artist, but a poster that I had so I could stand there and say, oh, entanglement to all of these people milling around with their champagne glasses. Um, so is it useful? Arguably so, but in each case, the quantum origin is an important selling point. People like to use it because it has this quantum, quantumness behind it. But really, when you're when you have a computer program, you don't care about the the elegance and beauty of the algorithm behind it. You just want the results at the end. So it's still at the point where it's nice because of the process it comes from, not be, not just because of the results that it gives. So it's only a step zero into showing that uh, quantum computers can be used for procedural generation, especially as I noted at the beginning, because it's, it's better to run it on a simulator. 
So let's go for at least a step one, which is something that is better to run on a quantum computer. It runs very nicely on a quantum computer. And that is this quantum procedure, uh, again for map generation, but it's going to be a different type of map this time. Um, so, well, let's just crack on. When you're using a near-term quantum computer, and I would encourage you to do so, then you have to uh, deal with the fact that it's not just going to run the textbook algorithms straight away, uh, because the textbook algorithms probably will ask for you to do a, a Fourier transform, uh, which is a completely uh, unrealistic thing to do on co current hardware. Current hardware is uh, has, has noise and it has limited connectivity typically between the qubits. So you will have, um, well, you can see if I go to, should have included an image around here somewhere. If you look at, say, this uh, coupling map of an IBM quantum device, these circles are your qubits and the neighboring qubits are ones connected by a line. So those you can do a two qubit gate. So you're limited in the two qubit gates you're actually allowed to do by the hardware. So if you want to do something that's going to be successful, it's going to run, it's going to have good results in the near term, you have to think very much about the qubits you've got, the connectivity they have, and all of that kind of thing. So let's think deeply about a single qubit. How much could we squeeze out of one single qubit? Well, I, I do have a procedure for, I do have as an example, of procedural generation, one that I'm not going to talk about today, um, single qubit procedural generation, where you generate an entire infinite world with just one qubit, at the very extreme of, of, of meditating a lot on just one qubit and seeing what you can get out of it. Um, but the idea is, uh, if you want to mathematically model a qubit, then you need three variables. So there's this variable, which is the expectation value of Z, which is uh, related to the probability of getting a zero or a one. If this Z value is, at the, ha, is plus one, that means you're definitely going to get a zero if you measure your qubit. And if it's the other extreme, which is minus one, then you're definitely going to get a one if you measure your qubit. And then there's similarly two other variables, X and Y, which similarly can be between minus one and plus one. And they're subject to this constraint that X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared has to be less than or equal to one for a valid qubit state. And therefore, uh, it's like uh, you can visualize your, the state of a qubit as a, uh, as a sphere. So it's a nice spherical visualization, and it means that the gates we apply also sort of, it's like they move a, a point around on the surface of a sphere. So what could you do with a single qubit? Well, you could model a, a sphere. You could model rotations around a sphere. Of course, there are much better ways of doing that than using a single qubit. Um, but it is, nevertheless, something you could argue that a qubit is very well uh, suited to. So if you, if you wanted to come up with an application for just a single qubit, modeling rotations around the surface of a sphere could be one. Uh, instead, we're going to think of it in a bit of a different way. Uh, we're going to think of, let's try and make an AI that could play a game like Civilization. So Civilization is the game where you've got a bunch of nations on a map, and uh, they're all trying to just build the biggest country they can. So uh, sometimes they act aggressively, sometimes they act defensively, sometimes they just go off and explore um, land that no one's got to so far. So and of course, they can't do all three things at once. They've got limited resources. They have to somehow share between these different kinds of policies. So in our simple AI, for something playing this a game like that, let's just use our qubit as the AI for a single nation and use these three variables as how aggressive it is, how defensive it is, how explorative it is, and then the constraint of it being bound to the surface of a sphere corresponds to the constraint that it can't do everything maximally. So it's a very sort of simple way of thinking, well, let's take what a qubit is, try and do something interesting with that. Um, but of course, uh, you don't just uh, 
you don't just think about the actions of a single nation in a game like this. Uh, nations will meet other nations and they'll have to think about whether they're friends or their enemies and they'll have to react to what the other nations are doing. So let's think of what pairs of qubits are. Well, just as a single qubit is described by three variables, pairs of qubits are described by 15. I said 16 here, but there's one that's trivial, so I shouldn't really have counted that. And these are the multi-qubit expectation values. So you have Z tensor I, I tensor Z, and Z tensor Z. What do they mean? Well, Z tensor I is just a Z variable for one of your qubits. And I tensor Z is a Z variable for your other qubit. So as I described, these are related to probability. You'll get a zero or a one if you measure these qubits. Z tensor Z looks at their correlations. So what is the probability that if you measure both your qubits that their results will agree or disagree? And similarly, you have a bunch of other correlations that are relevant for qubits that, that are required to describe the details of how these things can become entangled. Uh, and all of these can be manipulated by single qubit gates and two qubit gates. So I'm not going to dwell a lot on all of the details of that because you could spend a long time on that. But um, one way you can find out about all of that is using the interactive exercises that exist in the Kiskit textbook, which you can see a link to on the screen. Um, or if you don't have time to copy down the link, it's called Hello Kiskit and it's in the Kiskit textbook. So that's enough to Google. Now, so these var variables are um, depicted visually and the action of gates are depicted visually as well. You could also make more levels for Hello Kiskit as a hackathon project. Anyway, using those correlations, we could describe how pairs of nations uh, behave towards another. So rather than just have that one is aggressive and the other is defensive, we can have specifically that one nation is aggressive um, and defensive against particular neighbors or that they, um, yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. So using this, we have the ability to take the, like measure, take a quantum circuit, measure these variables for all of the qubits and use them to decide what's going to happen in the next round of a game like Civilization. So first we have to make a very simple game that they can play. So we have this uh, idea that um, the only thing they do is place cities. So they decide when a new city is going to be. Cities have spheres of influence, which mean that their territory grows. And using that, they can um, influence territory that their neighbor has and therefore steal a bit of territory for them. But it's all just done through influence rather than anything else. And um, then you can uh, use the quantum circuit to decide how everyone's going to move. And then you can look at how the, the territory changes. And you can use that then to add more circuits to the end of the quantum circuit. So, the, the, so you uh, add some more circuits to the end such that if a nation loses territory, you make it more defensive. And if a nation steals a city off another because it's influenced it so much, then that affects the entanglement between those two uh, nations. So your feed, so it's a hybrid quantum classical process where you're feeding back into the quantum circuit um, some extra gates, which means that then uh, the new circuit is used to just, uh, tell you what happens in the next round, and then what the consequences of what happens in the next round gives you new gates to add to your circuit, and so on and so forth. And um, this is all built. So I, I use something called quantum graph uh, to do this. And that is made so that rather than saying, uh, OK, I need to add something to my quantum circuit to reflect this, I'm going to add a Hadamard. It's built more on the idea that you would say, OK, I need to make my qubit go more towards Z. I need to raise the, um, the value of Z. Um, and so do that. And then quantum graph will figure out what quantum gate will, will have that effect. So you can think of it more in terms of manipulating these variables than standard quantum gates. Um, but anyway, what this does is basically uh, meets a device where it's at. You use the, uh, the layout of the quantum circuit as a way of um, placing the nations initially so that the, 
neighboring qubits on the device will correspond to neighboring nations and then therefore they are therefore the ones for which you'll do entangling gates you just do the, the, the gates that you have available to you and uh, by doing so you get sort of quantum dynamics which you then translate into sort of very quantum dynamics that the device can easily do and you translate that into something interesting which is the um, the historical generation of a geopolitical map so at the end you end up with a geopolitical map a bunch of nations with borders but you also have the whole history of how those borders were made and where the cities were placed which if you were to use this in a game uh, could allow you to then have an, an interesting dynamic lived in universe which you can set your game in um, so we have to show that this which is a very rudimentary AI, but you have to show it's at least intelligent in some way. And for that, it has to be better than uh, random. Uh, so if you had a, a, a nation which is working in the way I described, where you're getting this feedback based on what's happening in the game, adding new circuits to that um, nation's qubit, then that sort of adaptive nation has to be better than one that just behaves randomly. And better means that it should have more territory because that's what it's trying to do so if we look at simulated versions of this game we find that there is a very definite um, uh, improve so ones that behave in the adaptive way are better than just random opponents and if we run it on real devices so we ran it on a 28 qubit uh, and a 53 qubit real device then you still see that the uh, that the the actual quantum adaptive nations are better than just the random ones. The, there's some overlap in the error bars, but there is a, still a clear distinction, even on noisy devices. Okay, so I'm coming near to the end. I just want to very briefly then tell you about our third thing, which is quantum natural language generation on near-term devices. So one aspect of the last thing is it's kind of like the some of the algorithms we could use for imaginary time evolution, which you might use for something like quantum chemistry. But then we, we're taking kind of a quantum chemistry-like thing and using it for procedural generation instead. Similarly, we can take something which analyzes natural language, which is not a generation procedure, and use it to do natural language generation. So you can always just take existing tools that aren't made for procedural generation and think, how am I going to do something fun with this? Generate some content that could be used in a game. Uh, so in this, we basically generate random sentences. So we want to generate a sentence on a particular topic. So what we're going to do is generate a random sentence, ask our quantum natural language um, analysis machine, what topic is this about? If it's about the topic we want, great. If it's not, then we are going to move our random Policy, uh, a random sentence to a neighboring sentence. A neighboring sentence means it means that either we insert a new word or substitute an existing word with a different one, or we delete an old word. And then we can go from different um, sentences to neighboring sentences. So in this toy example, uh, we're going to try and generate a sports headline. So what we do is that we take this variational circuit which is trained on a data set and we take an initial candidate uh, sentence in this case johnson continues new policy and we are going and we want a sports headline so does johnson continues new policy correspond to a sports headline well if we run this uh, natural language analysis so natural language processing which was actually created by uh, bob kirker and collaborators uh, at Cambridge Quantum Computing. Uh, so it's something that they made the software for, and then we ran it on IBM Quantum Devices. So if we do that, what it tells us is that uh, its sportiness is 5%, its politicsiness is 82%. Because this was trained on a data set where Johnson was a relevant um, political term. So it seems like a very political headline. So that's not what we want. We want something that's at least 90 five percent sporty so we're going to change our sentence we'll delete new johnson continues policy it's a bit more sporty but it's still very politicsy so we reject it 
So what about if we substitute policy with winning? Johnson continues willing, winning, and we generate the corresponding circuit, we run it, and we find that it's even less sporty than before, um, because that can still very much be a politics headline. Um, so no. So let's revert those changes because things got uh, worse. We go back to Johnson um, continues policy, and we'll substitute Johnson with Arsenal. And so um, then we find that this is an extremely sporty sentence, Arsenal, of course, being a football team. Um, it's not quite uh, at, as sporty as we'd like because Arsenal continues policy when it could have a policy, but uh, it's not really that sporty word to have in a sentence. So let's go for Arsenal continues winning. Very sporty, there we go. So we've taken something for the analysis of natural language and used it to make something that generates natural language, another procedural generation task. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say. Um, so even now we can make quantum software that's useful for uh, procedural generation and there is existing software that you can use in a hackathon or just for fun um, to do that. Uh, or you can just take something off the shelf that was never intended for procedural generation and use it for, for procedural generation anyway. Um, so, yeah, I encourage you to do so. You can follow me on Twitter and Mastodon. And now I'm going to move off this slide because this GIF makes my fan cry. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your presentation. Uh, this was incredible. Uh, I loved especially all of the references to games. I love Super mm -hmm. Mario and uh, everything you showed. It. Uh, everybody was very active in the chat, so uh, we absolutely enjoyed your talk. Um, I want to ask you some more about the games. Um, mm -hmm. I personally used uh, the Hello Kiss Kit in the past. I think it was called Hello Quantum. Um, I think that yeah. was the first game for a quantum computer, am I right? Um, well, so, well, in my mind at least, Hello Kids Kit and Hello Quantum are slightly different. Hello Quantum is the app version, which was very, very much a game. You can give it to kids and they'll sit there and they'll play all the levels and then you can say to them, did you know you did some quantum? And then you can explain about it afterwards. Hello Kids Kit is unashamedly pedagogical. It tells you what you're going to learn in this puzzle and then you learn it and it tells you what you learned. But, um, but basically they're the same thing. Um, so yeah, this was, this was born out of a project, a collaboration with IBM. I wasn't an IBMer at the time, uh, where we, we wanted to, to make a game, one of the first games for a quantum computer and put it on an app and have that to generate some interest in quantum computing and, and teach people about it. Uh, but this, as a game, doesn't run on a quantum computer. So games that run on quantum computers, uh, I, I've looked at other, so there, there are other things that are arguably the first game for a quantum computer that satisfy that condition. Well, can you give an example of what would be uh, in your mind the first game that actually runs in a quantum computer? So I did something uh, that I called cat box scissors, which is basically like rock, paper, scissors, and really you're just using the quantum computer as a, as a random number generator, effectively being the opponent in a game of rock, paper, scissors. So that's arguably the first. Um, so, and that's a, a kind of pattern that a lot of people have uh, followed since then. If people want to make a game that uses a quantum computer, um, one thing that people do quite often is just use the quantum computer for random number generation. Um, and that's fine. Uh, but uh, the procedural generation work was born out of the idea of let's do something more sophisticated for the quantum computer. Yeah, I love seeing your island and how it's it looks very much like an island and it has this randomness in it. Um, but but it is like because of how you created it, then it makes sense. We can identify it as an island, right? Um, yeah. So that was that was very very interesting. Um, 
I want to ask you some uh, different questions. So you mentioned that you created a citizen science project in 2016. What was that about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in 20, what was it? I guess it was the end of 2014. I was in a Rosa, which is where uh, Schrodinger came up with the wave equation. And I had the second best quantum idea that anyone had had in a Rosa, which is that, um, you know, quantum computers so far away, no, no person in the general public can get their hands on a quantum computer. So how can we bring our research closer to people? And I thought, well, my research in quantum error correction um, is basically just solving puzzles. You, you run these circuits that give you clues about the errors that have happened, and then you have to try and solve these clues to figure out what error happened and how to get around it. Well, these are puzzles that we can package up and, and give to members of the public, and then people can start to think about how they would, would solve these problems, and we can see what insights that uh, they might give us. So um, that was the idea I had, and then in 2015, I got some funding to do it, and in 2016, I uh, created these games uh, called Dikadoku, which is where my Twitter handle comes from even today. Um, they might still be on the App Store. I think they were probably taken off because I couldn't be bothered to update them. Um, but yeah, so it's, uh, it's just uh, making quantum error correction into a game. That's super fun. And uh, I think for us out there who are curious and like a talent and games, this is a, a very fun way of, of trying anything and maybe even mm -hmm. discovering the solution to a puzzle that you had already been looking for, right? Yeah. Have you had the situation where a member of the public found an answer to, to a problem that you had that you couldn't solve before? Um, so, well, one of the participants uh, wrote a genetic algorithm to uh, to solve the the puzzles, and by studying that genetic algorithm, I I was inspired. I, I found a certain property that it did um, that was very useful, and so uh, yeah, so that 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 could have been a, a something that everyone would now credit the Godoku with discovering. Unfortunately, someone else discovered the same thing at the same time. <laughs> that sometimes happens, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, but now we have uh, several questions from the audience. So uh, everybody keep asking your questions. Uh, we have a question from Crowbar Massad. Uh, we're going to read about remeasuring qubits. If we wanted to work on your challenge, finding the three grid version of 202, uh, that your colleagues implemented in 2014. Yeah, so well, uh, so the paper, you can go to the paper on the 202 code and uh, that will tell you the, the principle behind it. So you've got two qubits that you want to see, you're interested in whether errors happen on them, and you use two other auxiliary qubits in order to make the measurements you need to make. But uh, uh, if you can keep on measuring the same qubit, you can use just one auxiliary qubit and use it for one of those measurements and then use it for the other one and then back to the first one again. Uh, so that's kind of the principle behind something that you could do there. Okay. Uh, we have a question by Dentoki Kirby. What is your favorite video game and why? Um, so I think I would have to say as like a video game series, I would say Breath of the uh, so the the Legend of Zelda. So I'm excited uh, in a few months for the new Legend of Zelda game to come out. But I also really love sort of relaxing indie games. So there's a game called Little Gator at the moment, which you're just a little alligator wandering around, and it's it's like a very chilled out version of Zelda. Oh, nice. Uh, that sounds uh, definitely something to explore. Uh, okay, we have a question by uh, Cosmo Druid. There is a classical generator algorithm called wave function collapse. Um, I don't know if you, you know it and you could elaborate on its relation with quantum generation, generation algorithms. Yeah, so it's kind of a, that's an interesting one in that it's kind of a classical algorithm, but it was inspired by uh, quantum computing. So you have this notion of, of sort of having a lot of possibilities all at once and then collapsing down to a particular one. 
Uh, so it's inspired by like the theory behind quantum computing, but in terms of how it actually works, it, it works in a way that's very incompatible with quantum computing. You can't choose where your wave function collapse to, collapses to in real life quantum computing. So I, I have thought a lot, I, I should be able to come up with a quantum version of wave function collapse, surely. But I've never, I've never worked it out. Maybe someone else who's cleverer than me can do it. So take this as an invitation to everybody here in the audience to try it out and try mm -hmm. to create a quantum, a uh, real quantum version of wave function collapse. Uh, okay, we have a question from uh, Sprig Litka. Uh, do you think quantum computers will create more lifelike realities when they are strong enough and available enough to run on at home? Yeah, so I think, I'm not sure whether we will ever get a quantum computer at home. It may be, there's this apocryphal tale of someone, uh, I think may, sometimes they say it was someone at IBM who says that there would only be a market for like five computers in the world and uh, they were proven wrong. So when we say now people will never have quantum computers at home, maybe we'll be proven wrong. But I, I tend to believe that there will be in the cloud uh, and so... Uh, so you'll probably be asking them for, uh, at the beginning of a level, you might be asking them to make you a new level. And as for what they could be useful for, uh, well, I think they will well, they will give people new tools in procedural generation to, to solve problems that they would have had to work around at the moment. So I think it, it might lead to people being able to be more creative and, and doing uh, things interesting things that they couldn't do before. Um, I'm not sure that you'll be able to sit down and tell, oh, this was definitely a, a quantum regenerated thing, though. Um, yeah. But maybe. Um, maybe. We have a question by Freeman7. Uh, have you heard anything about any C vector annealing service? Um, no, it's the uh, simple and boring answer to that. That's That's perfect. Um, Rado, Radoye asks, when do you think quantum computing will be mature enough to make a substantial impact on the gaming market? Um, yeah, that's, uh, so, sub yeah, I don't know. It depends kind of, it, it depends partly on, on, of course, hardware and the development of hardware. And it depends also on maybe creativity. I would say that it's not, I, I, I prefer to sort of focus on um, the impact it could have on, on hackathons, on people who are wanting to learn about quantum computing and they're just making a little game jam game and they're experimenting with quantum computing. I think that, that's where it can make an impact in the near term. When it's gonna make a, like a serious commercial impact, uh, it's, it's easy to always say 10 years. I think people have been saying 10 years for many years. So let's say 10 years. <laughs> uh, love it. Uh, we, in general, like to say 10 years because it's close enough that it doesn't feel like never, but far enough that nobody will be expecting any anything soon enough to remember or answer. Um, yeah, no impending deadlines. Yes. Okay. Um, do we, uh, okay, we have a lot of people still asking a lot of questions in the chat, but we're running out of time. So I will ask all of you to go to the Discord and keep asking your questions there. And James, if you're very kind, you can go to the Discord and answer everybody's questions. Um, yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna have to go to prepare for our next talk. But thank you so much, James. This was definitely one of the most fun talks uh, for everybody who's a game lover. Uh, I'm sure they enjoyed your talk, and for everybody who's maybe watching this as a recording, hopefully too. Thank you for yeah, your answers okay. to our questions. So Have a good day. Thanks.